Okay, let us get started. Uh, thank you all for coming. We have um, over 300 people registered, but um, most of the people are um, attending this session by, by Zoom. I'm going to do a very quick introduction presentation of my friend Julio Frank. Um, before anything, I declare my bias given that uh, Julia and I have been friends for a long time, and therefore my um, assessment might be biased because of that long friendship. We went to medical school together, and uh, I have the privilege of having, being the godfather of his son. So it's just to tell you that it's a long and uh, uh, exceedingly happy for me, friendship. Um, Julio is uh, currently, as you all know, president of the University of Miami. Uh, prior of that, he was the dean of the Harvard School of uh, Public Health, my alma mater. Before that, he had many important positions. Um, of course, a secretary, of Health of Mexico, Assistant Director General of WHO. So the uh, history of uh, positions health, both in the health area, but also in the education area is uh, very, very long. Um, it was here uh, at UCSF in 2007 that we held a conference uh, that was uh, in a way, the beginning of the Consortium of Universities of Global Health, but also the seed of the Lancet Commission for Health Professionals Education, um, which was published by the commissioners led by Julio and uh, Dr. Lincoln Chen um, in 2010 as a Lancet Commission report. So, what we will be hearing today is um, 12 years after the Lancet Commission, how the COVID pandemic affected um, health professions education and what are the challenges and opportunities derived from the pandemic. So without further ado, let me pass the microphone to Julio. Welcome, Julio. Thank you very much. Um, I am truly honored to be here. Um, thank you to the audience here in present and everyone following uh, the streaming. Uh, and thank you very much to my very dear friend, Jaime Sepulveda. As he said, we, we were classmates. Uh, so we, we've gone in medical school. So we've gone a long way in, in this path towards global health. <clears throat> we're part of... Um, one of Mexico's prime export products, which is public health experts, uh, global health experts. So, uh, but I wanted to use this opportunity and I, and I really thank him for the invitation because uh, we are going through a very unique moment in history, I think for universities in general, and obviously UCSF as a, one of the premier health sciences universities in the world is really a, a, a very important venue to discuss the title of the, of the presentation, The Future of Health Professional Education. So let me um, get started with the, the origins of this. And Jaime just mentioned that in 2010, to mark the 100th anniversary of the Flexner Report, the Lancet published, Lancet has now published dozens of commission reports, but this was actually uh, the third or fourth Lancet Commission report. It was an early commission report. And I had the honor of co-chairing that with Lincoln Chen. Jaime was actually a member of the, of the commission, along with some other very distinguished leaders in, in, uh, in health and in education. And it published this report, Health Professionals for a New Century, um, in 2010. Uh, it's been a widely cited report. Here is the citations as of Ju January 5th, the beginning of this month. And, and, and it's, it's, it's gathered a lot of attention 
And part of, uh, uh, of, of that is because I think it, 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 it was published at a time when there were a lot of interesting changes going on. We had planned to do a 10 year update, uh, but that would have been 2020 and you know, something else was keeping us <laughs> awake in 2020, uh, more urgent than health professional education. So given the pandemic, um, we delayed that. And actually that turned out to be a, a, a good thing uh, because we were able to take into account the consequences of the pandemic uh, for, for health professional education. And, and that is the report that appeared in the October 29th issue of The Lancet as a follow-up. It's not a commission, it's a follow-up. And, and it is called Challenges and Opportunities for Educating Health Professionals After the COVID-19 Pandemic. It really, we pivoted from what was an, an overview of what happened during the 10 years. That is still there. And we added this, the main part of this article, which is to understand what happened with the pandemic. And what happened is that COVID-19 was not so much an initiator of changes, but a, an accelerator, a great accelerator of changes. And um, the point we make is that a lot of the trends we are seeing today had started actually just around the time we published the 2010 report. Um, that, that, that second decade of the 21st century was incredibly um, productive in terms of ideas and innovations in education. 2012 was declared by the New York Times, the year of the MOOC was the rise of massive open online courses, which uh, of course were predicted as the end of universities as we know that, that didn't happen, but they really disrupted education. We were in that when COVID hit. And thanks to the advances of that, most universities were actually able to pivot to hybrid mechanisms of, of instruction. Um, and more importantly, there was a cultural acceptance of technology as part of education in general, in higher education, particularly in health professions, because of the fact that, that, um, that the pandemic forced that on, on many, many institutions of higher learning. So I see the pandemic as an accelerator of some of these changes, and that's what I want to, to discuss. I think our main duty after the pandemic, or we're still not completely out of the pandemic, but in this, as we can contemplate the post-pandemic phase of COVID-19, um, our, 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 you know, after this collective trauma for humankind, after all the loss and suffering that the pandemic has brought upon humankind, our main duty is certainly not to go back to the old normal, but not even a new normal as we talk, but really truly really to build a better normal, make sure that what comes after the pandemic is better than what we had before. So um, what, what drove the changes? As I say, pretty much between the end of the first and the beginning of the second decade of the 21st century. Bear in mind that, um, for whatever reason, education was one of the few areas of human endeavor that did not experience a technological revolution in the 20th century. I mean, compared to healthcare or almost anything else, transportation, whatever, uh, <clears throat> that revolution started happening in, the, in, the, in, in that period of time, around the end of the first and the beginning of the second decade of the 21st century. And that certainly has been one of the drivers of change. But those advances in technology were grounded in advances in the learning sciences. Uh, like almost all technological development, it was based on real progress in understanding how, how humans, and in our case, adult humans, because it's slightly different with children, learn. And then that started getting translated, translated into a number of technologies. Uh, you know, we basically finished the 20th century with the, our biggest improvement was, um, PowerPoint, but PowerPoint is just another expression of the printed word. So it's not a qualitative difference from what Gutenberg achieved. It is, it, it, it is, it is really remarkable. If someone from the main 19th century materialized here, that person would feel completely out of place almost anywhere in our society, except in a classroom. Because the classroom would sound awfully similar, right? An older person talking to younger people in front of a room, preaching, et cetera. I mean, it's, it's, it's been the same model. 
But that really started changing. And I do think that, that those advances in, in basic understanding of the learning sciences were fundamental. The third big driver was the dynamism of the labor market. Because of advances in technology in other fields, like automation, artificial intelligence, we are now in an era where while students are studying, their professional field is being transformed and new professions are being created. So almost by definition, we can no longer expect to be able to develop all the competencies needed to be effective in the labor market while students are in the institution of higher education, almost by definition, because the changes are happening so fast that by the time they, uh, they graduate, there's, there's whole new fields of opportunity and the existing fields have been disrupted. So that dynamism, I think, uh, has been a third big, big driver. Now, in the, in the uh, original 2010 report, we, one of the things we tried to do was develop a systemic view to understand health professional education. I'm, I'm not going to go through all of that. It's actually a, a big part of that report is trying to show how, as you see here, health professional education lies exactly at the intersection of the higher education system and the health system. And we tried to be a little bit explicit on how those two systems, the education and the health system, interact. Uh, I'm not gonna repeat that. It's a more of a conceptual part of that, of that article, but that systemic approach, I think is absolutely crucial. And, 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 the, and, and it also underscores the centrality of health professional as a subsystem that's shared within two systems. Obviously we're sitting here in a health sciences campus, right? I mean, non-academic hospitals are not called campuses and, and universities that don't have health sciences don't, don't talk about that. This is the best almost physical architectural expression of that intersection, a, an institution that's simultaneously part of the health system and part of the education system. With that perspective, the uh, framework we use in the 2010 and which we did use again here is to talk about two fundamental dimensions of any new strategy. The first one we call the instructional and the other the institutional uh, 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 dimension. And this is actually echoing the Flexner report. When you read the Flexner report, it's a statement about instruction, what to teach and how to teach it. But it's equally a statement about the institutions that ought to produce medical education. Because until the Flexner report, most medical education happened in independent proprietary medical schools. It's with the Flexner report and some pioneering institutions like this university that medical schools became part of universities and, and the only way of getting a, a medical degree. So Flexner has not just the instructional, but also the institutional and sort of following that model, we did that with the 2010 report and, and we follow that. The big difference I think is that that technological foundation, those platforms have become much more developed in these 12 years since the 2010 report. Again, they weren't created by the pandemic, they were, but the pandemic accelerated them and they are advancing at a very, very fast. So let me just outline all of this is explained in much, much greater detail in the paper that was just published in 2019. It was followed by an international conference on the future of health professionals education. Um, that, that was, uh, a, a, a great a great discussion. There's a lot of detail there. By the way, one of the, I didn't mention this when I mentioned all the citations, uh, but there is a web annex to that paper that has a systematic review of all, not all uh, the citations, but those that are most relevant to the topics that did not appear in the printed version of the article, but it is in a web annex. And anyone who wants to get a very comprehensive perspective on what was published between 2010 and 2018, which is where we were, no, sorry, 20, 2020, the first year of the pandemic, that is in that web annex. So let me start with the instructional dimension. And that itself forces us to answer two key questions, articulate some strategic shifts, and then think 
historically whether we are at the threshold of a new generation of reforms. And the key questions, I mean, these are the, quick, the key questions in any instructional strategy. What to teach, that's what the curriculum is all about. How to teach, that's the mode of instruction. How much technology, have, what do we do, do with uh, classrooms? Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Then when to teach has become a very important element of the discussion. How do we target, what, what period in the life course do we target? And then very importantly is whom to teach. And that has to do with uh, issues of access and diversity. As we try to answer these questions, we need to be cognizant of some fundamental strategic shifts that are already happening. And I just pointed a few of them, actually three of them, uh, but obviously they, there may be others. The first, and to me, the most important one is that we are moving from thinking of universities. Again, this applies to all of higher education, but obviously we're talking about that subsystem of health professionals education. It's thinking about higher education as a closed system, which has been the traditional way. It's a closed system that has an input, we call it admissions, and there's a throughput. It's the educational process itself. Usually good things happen to people who, who are being educated. And then there's an output, that's graduation. We send people out into the real world, as we call it, and that's it. And you know, in the licensed professions like medicine or nursing or dentistry, the health professions, you need to be relicensed and therefore you need to have some continuing education, but you're pretty much done in, in that closed system. In the highway of your life, you go into a tunnel. It's a good tunnel. It's wide open. It's illuminated. You get a lot of stuff, but then you exit the tunnel and you, you continue with your life. That model is not going to work anymore. Uh, and it, it, we need to assume an open architecture where universities redesign themselves as providers of dynamic educational services to satisfy the needs, the educational needs of people throughout their entire careers. Beyond just the updating of skills and competencies, which is what we do with traditional continuing education, as I was saying in the licensed professions, beyond that, this really has to be a, a much more dynamic system. The second big change is that from a highly, which follows from the first, is from a highly standardized experience where we have rigorous accreditation bodies, et cetera, we need to be moving, um, realizing that if we're going to be an open system, the needs that we're gonna be catering to are gonna be much more diverse than what we've had. Uh, if, if we really think that, instead of higher education being something that happens typically to young people during a limited period of their life before they enter the labor market, we need to switch that into an idea that we're gonna to have to meet people where they work throughout their entire career. And that means that you need to sensitive and responsive to very diverse needs. And finally, that means moving from a model, the current model where, where we front load the costs and content of higher education, undergraduate and graduate, to model that in the paper we call education for life. And this is probably the biggest idea and I'm gonna explain it in a moment. But before I do that, uh, we do open the question. This graph is taken from the 2010 report. We speak of three generations of reform. Obviously the, the generation that was launched by the Flexner Report, which was a science-based, with an instructional dimension of a science-based curriculum, and then moving medical schools and nursing schools and dentistry schools and the other health professional schools to a university, to the problem-based generation around the 1970s, and a burst of really very creative energy in higher education and in, in health professional education, to what we call now a systems-based approach, a third generation, uh, uh, more driven by competencies, by an understanding of the dynamic between local and global, and moving from academic centers to a, a systemic view, like the one I uh, expressed in, in the in the first sec or the second slide. We all, it's an open question: Are we at the threshold of a fourth generation, a new generation of reforms that really exploits the potential of? of the advances of, in the learning sciences and the ensuing technologies. 
हेलो कुछ well it, it, it's just that the, in the 1900s and 1910 the the health professional schools were moved to a university to the university environment in the 70s is when you started seeing the rise of academic medical centers as as they were called bringing together multiple schools at, uh, 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 and attached and, and and what we expand now is the con connection to health and education systems more the understanding of the entire system or ecosystem of, of that this is in the 2010 in this, it, with great detail this is just really to motivate the question of whether we are at the for, at, at, a, at the beginning of a fourth generation so in the this recent paper from from october we uh, offer four new strategic elements that, that build on the 2010 report but that i think are the ones that show the impact of the uh, pandemic in a more clear way. The first one is education for life, then the need for a new set of competencies, the expansion of inter and what we call transprofessional education, and then the need to learning into different technologies and, and exploit the full potential of some of those technologies. Let me start with education for life. Um, this is a big part of the of the recent paper, and I'm just going to summarize it in one slide, so I'm not doing it much justice. But the starting with the drivers of change, I spoke about new educational technologies stemming from advances in the science of learning and the dynamism in the health system, which is where uh, the labor market dynamism is where the supply of new professionals from universities meets the demand from healthcare uh, institutions. Uh, we propose that the response to this new reality is what we call education for life. And education for life has three meanings. The first one is learning throughout the entire life. That's the most obvious. But it also, if you look at what it means to do something for something else, education for life, it means that in the case of the health professions, it is actually learning to promote and restore health. It is the substantive content of what we do. And then finally, and this is something that the pandemic didn't create, but it augmented and made more visible. Education for life is also learning to live one's own life. Learning, it's education for a productive, meaningful, rewarding life. And that in, in, introduces now elements such as work-life balance, burnout, prevention of burnout, and basically the definition of meaning and sense to one's professional life. And so those are three distinctive elements. I would say that in all of higher education, the first and the third are common. Learning throughout life and learning to live one's own life in a way that's sustainable and healthy are common to everyone. Of course, the domain of health professional education, learning to promote and restore life, it's the content of health professional education. <clears throat> now, let me just touch a little bit on the first one. We are in the business of mostly educating leaders. And, um, and so if we think of what we do as continuous leadership development, then we can focus on future leaders, on emerging leaders, on current leaders, people who are Currently, and in mature leaders, people who have had extended. So, for future leaders, these are typically our young people. And these are conventional degree programs. We're not going to stop doing, you know, everything I'm saying doesn't mean that we stop having what we do, we stop doing what we're doing now. But this has been the main focus of most of what we do in universities. Um, uh, tra traditionally is focus on, on, on future young people that we admit and then we educate with uh, uh, in that front loaded model. However, once future leaders are working, are immersed in the labor market, in the labor force, they will have the need for continuing education. As I say, part of that may be requirements for licensure, but part of that will be because their current profession is being either um, displaced or disrupted at least 
by advances in technology or because those same advances are creating whole new opportunities. That's a, 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 a new frontier of dynamism. Apart from that, there's been a traditional need <clears throat> when people are successful and they are emerging as leaders is, is a pervasive problem we have in the health sciences, which is the fact that people who are highly successful in a professional field get promoted to positions of leadership in their own field because professionals have a very strong ethos of recognizing authority from peers. And therefore, they are promoted, and not just in the health professions, almost in any profession. This is a pervasive problem. It is the promotion of non-management professionals into managerial roles for which almost nothing in their initial training educated them. So the great surgeon who now becomes the head of the uh, surgery division and you know, now has to deal with strategic planning and budgeting and HR and, and all of that stuff. And there was nothing in the original training that led to that. Or the lawyer who becomes a partner in a major law firm or the professor who becomes a department chair or a dean or a provost or a head of an institute or a president, right? I mean, it's a pervasive problem. So whether it's the disruption brought by technology or even the consequence of success in one's own professional field, there's that uh, very important part of that. And then at some point, we actually are thrown into a leadership position. And that's where we think that immersive fora are a, 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 an absolute necessity. I, uh, as you heard from Dr. Sepulveda, prior to my current job, I was dean of the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And one of the programs I instituted was a program for newly appointed ministers of health, mostly from sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, but actually from all over the world, but with a focus on those areas. And, and it, you know, it, 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 it stemmed from my own experience, even me who had been an academic in health systems, I was appointed by a number of contiguous circumstances to be the federal secretary of health at a time when you know having experts in government was actually not thought as a crazy idea. And you know, the feeling of loneliness and <laughs> disorientation that you feel, you say, how do you do this? I mean, what, what is this? We all have a first time when we have a new position of responsibility. And I think it's up to universities to provide not traditional courses. These are highly experienced people very senior people, but immersive for. And we actually started something called the Harvard Ministerial Leadership Program in Health. It's been enormously successful. It's now been running for more than 12 years with hundreds of ministers. It got extended to ministers in other portfolios, finance ministers and education ministers and other ministers, because there was a need for this, an appetite for that. And then finally, you get mature leaders, people who have already done that, uh, who, who really, especially with extended lifespans, require lifelong learning, sometimes to reinvent themselves or to enrich their life once they've been a very highly experienced people. And the, the, the universities in this open architecture need to be the place where the place, the space, both real and virtual, where those multiple generations with that mix of experiences converge in, in, in this arc of leadership. We need to cover the entire arc of leadership, not just focus on the future, although that will continue to be a very important part of our job. Let me quickly go through the other elements and I'm just gonna mention them quickly, the new set of competencies, the inter and transprofessional and the integration of learning technologies. The new set of, um, of competencies, we propose in the, in the article what I would call the editors in the Lancet didn't like this. I thought it was a great analogy, but but anyway, so it's not expressed like that, but imagine a Latin I for the competencies. Um, uh, it's an extension of T-shaped competencies, which has been a, an idea, but we added a, a, a foundation of what we call foundational competencies. Uh, and this is basically the mastery of theories, concepts, and facts that are widely accepted by a professional com community, which form the basis of a, of a field of practice. Obviously, you need to know, you need to have that foundational, uh, that base of knowledge uh, of, of the state of the art. 
And that is and will continue to be a big part of, the, uh, of, of what we do. Then you have this vertical piece, which are the specialized competencies. And, and you know, how practice of different areas or, or specialization. Finally, you have the top cross-cutting set of competencies, which I think, given the labor market, are become increasingly important. They were always there, and they were always important. And some of them are the core of what we call liberal education, liberal arts and sciences education. But they become much more important. And we need to figure a way in which that can happen in professional schools. I had that challenge in my previous role as dean of a health professional school. And we try to be very systematic about integrative competencies. These are complex capabilities, such as critical thinking, numeracy. Everyone needs to understand data in our, in our, uh, in our world. So even our, you know, talking about undergraduate liberal arts and sciences education, even the poets need to understand numbers because otherwise you are uh, lost. Emotional intelligence, ethical deliberation, the ability to systematically on the more uh, communication proficiency, including, as we will see, for, for inter and transprofessional education, intercultural competencies in, in communication, and of course, teamwork. The reality of what happens in health systems is that it's teamwork. If we have siloed health professional schools that then need to learn on the job how to work together, I, I think we're doing a service to those professions. Um, you know, health science universities like UCSF are actually a great laboratory to try that because they are by definition much more integrated than typical uh, uh, health professional schools that are embedded in a larger university. But that, that element of teamwork requires, among other competencies, the ability to understand other interpretive frames that may be different from, from, from ours, and the ability to, to understand, listen deeply, and, and comprehend the perspective of other people. Otherwise, you cannot work as a team. Um, and that includes the development of a competency to disagree respectfully, which I think is one of the most important things we need to do. So, so that is, you know, explaining in detail the idea of, 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 uh, of the, the, the different types of competencies. Finally, uh, we propose that the new realities precisely of teamwork force us to expand the uh, scope of interprofessional education. There's been, you know, when we published the 2010 report, there was already a very, very wide literature on interprofessional education, uh, but most of that was restricted to health professionals and particularly clinicians. Programs to, to train cl by clinicians, I mean health professionals that are in direct contact with patients, in direct patient care. I think a first expansion is to also talk about uh, population health sciences and, and public health practitioners. If there's one lesson from the pandemic is that these two groups need to work much closer as teams. And then we introduce the idea of transprofessional education. Both the non-professional health workers, like community health workers, who, who are non-professionals, and then the whole array of technicians and support staff. But then the mirror image of this, which are non-health professionals working in the health system. And that's increasingly an element that we need to take into account. Today, some of them are traditional professions like lawyers. The main source of employment of lawyers today in the United States is the health system, whether directly or indirectly through litigation, but something related. The same thing with managers and economists. But increasingly, the main place where computer scientists are working is in health systems, and they are part of the healthcare team. How do we create experiences from before people arrive at the workplace where we can work comfortably with other professions which find their main side of employment in healthcare institutions. That's what we discussed. Finally, the important thing here is to achieve an integration of learning technologies. I think there's huge potential for those technologies, but then they gotta be integrated in. in and here, there are two concepts that, I, that the paper tries to debunk. 
the idea that remote is equal to online? No, there are lots of applications of high quality online instruction that are not used, they are used with the same students who are present. And the idea of hybrid as equivalent to blended, it's, those are two different concepts. Hybrid is what we did during the pandemic. We separated groups of students depending on their circumstances. So somewhere, it's what we're doing now. And that's good for a lecture like this. But for an integrated framework, what we need is blended. And I will explain in a minute and very briefly because I'm out of time, what I mean by that. But uh, most of all, what we need to do is what we call in the paper, engaged learning. Engaged learning has three elements. It's active, that's the relationship of the learner to the learning material. Interactive, that's the interaction between the, learn, the learners themselves and with the instructors. And personalized, that means that you can pace progress according to personal uh, characteristics. The traditional online technologies and a lot of what was used during the pandemic was not like this. It was passive, there was no interaction, it was not personalized. It was the same passive learning as the traditional lecture in a lecture hall, except with the disadvantage that people weren't even in the same room. You could even, couldn't even read the body language and, and if everyone turned off their camera, even less. That's not, the pandemic accelerated that. That's not the model. That was a response to an emergency, not the status quo. Today, the new online platforms allow these three attributes. And I think this is a whole new world. So what we need is to be able to blend the online and in-person according to what in the original Lancet report we called three levels of learning, informative, formative, and transformative. Informative is what it says. It's the transmission of knowledge and discrete skills. Online learning is actually better. This, by the way, informative sorry, produces experts. But this big part of what we do in health professions education, but we also do formative learning, which is socializing people and making them professionals, not just experts. And then transformative learning is about developing leadership attributes and producing change agents, which are also professionals and experts but we need to transverse the three. And in a blended model, the mix depends on the level. So informative, actually online platforms, active, interactive, and personalized are actually superior to the traditional forms of instruction. For the formative level, you begin to require much more face-to-face -face interaction. And certainly for the transformative, that is what dominates. And that's the difference, hybrid models separated students according to their circumstances, blended models, blend the technological and the face-to-face -face component uh, according to the pedagogical imperatives, not separating different groups of students. The important thing is to make sure that we integrate the instructional design, that those three are not only seen as pieces of a puzzle, but that, that those pieces are well integrated. Whether it's high quality online, classroom or field experience, which for us is absolutely critical. Increasingly field, whether it's actually being in the, either in a clinic or out in the field or through simulation technologies, which is a way of simulating field conditions. But it's the integration of those different components that matters. <clears throat> Let me say one word, and it's only gonna be one slide about the instructional. Sorry, I, I finished the instructional about the institutional. This has to do with institutional entity, identity, particularly institutions that have a high research component, like many of the top universities in the US. They need to embrace education as equally intellectually challenging and rewarding as research. And that has not happened. There's a culture that devalues education. <laughs> we need to change that. Financing, we estimate that the entire world spends about $110 billion per year in health professional education. That looks like a lot of money, but it's only 1.2% of total spending. It is a very little. If you think that, you know, uh, those people are gonna make decisions about how to spend the, the, the re remaining, uh, whatever, 98.2%, that is uh, very little. There's the whole question of the academic workforce. Um, we need to renew our faculty. 
to be able to adopt these new principles of education, these new instructional principles. Um, there's a whole challenge of competency certification where we need to reflect through stackable credentials and, and other such forms, move beyond the traditional degree, not, not instead of, but in addition to more diversity. And then of course, there's the whole question of global connection that uh, we think that the new technologies allow for a much broader sharing of resources, educational resources across the world. Let me then just mention the, these are the main recommendations. It's basically what I have said. It's clearly exp explained in the paper uh, for, for adopt education for life as the guiding principle on the instructional, the three dimensions that I said, the development of that meta competence, which is learning to learn and uh, adaptive competencies that allow you, which were pretty much the, 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 the top cross-cutting competencies. Uh, on the institutional side, it's the idea of the open architecture, what I just mentioned about stackable credentials, and then the whole element of promoting workforce wellness. I think that was really brought home by the pandemic. In competencies, this I-shaped model, the idea of transprofessional education, uh, systemic approaches to correct imbalances with in the paper we touched briefly on the fact that most health professionals labor markets in the world are, are hugely imbalanced you have many countries where there are towns and cities without doctors or nurses and doctors especially without jobs and then finally uh, the the uh, idea of engaged and blended learning the need to continue to invest in high quality simulation and the integrated design. And something that we believe needs to be exploited much more is uh, the question of, of global networks, the faculty development so that we have faculty that are competent and introducing a culture of innovation and assessment. We need to start treating educational innovation the way we treat clinical innovations. Promote innovation and assess everything so that we know what works and what doesn't in what settings. Let me leave you with one final slide, which is a, 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 a paragraph from the 2010 report. But I think it's still, it's actually more relevant now because technological advances have flourished so much since we published that report. We, we talked a lot about IT enabled education in 2010, but we couldn't have foreseen what, ha what would happen in the in swing decade. And, and what we said there is that health is all about people. Beyond the glittery surface of modern technology, which is what we've been talking a lot about, the core space of every health system is occupied by the unique encounter, the unique encounter between one set of people who need services and another who have been entrusted to deliver those services. This trust is turned through a special blend of technical competence and service orientation, steered by ethical commitment and social accountability, which forms that blend forms the core of professional work. And then this last thing is so that we may never lose sight of why we're doing this. Through a chain of events flowing from effective learning to high quality services to improve health, professional education at its best makes an essential contribution to the well being of individuals, families, and communities. That's the chain of events of what we do there. We need to innovate so that we have more effective learning. But that's not the end. The end is better services. And that is not the end. The end is better health and well-being for people. Thank you very much. Um, and I think we will we have some time for, for some interaction. Thank you. Thank you, Julio. I, I suggest uh, we sit here. Okay. And hopefully this microphone is back there. For recording purposes, is it working? I don't think so. That was great. Um, I have a number of questions, but I also believe we're receiving questions from the audience. And Stephanie's in charge of that. So if you have questions coming from the audience, uh, but let me, let me get started um, with one. Um, I've heard you saying that uh, in the 20th century, we saw 
health sciences innovation progressively progressing very rapidly. While that was not the case in the education sector. You did allude to MOOCs. I remember 10 years ago, we were all about uh, developing MOOCs and so excited about how MOOCs would uh, change the whole education system. I haven't heard about MOOCs in a long time. So can you talk about the different pace of innovation between the health sector and the education sector? And uh, is, is the education sector finally catching up in innovation? Do you see real progress behind the uh, uh, MOOCs uh, and all the technologies with now Zoom and the very same fact that we are having this uh, conference as a hybrid model? Is that progress in the right direction? And how do you see the future of education innovations? So, I mean, I mentioned it quickly. Um, I think we need to introduce into the educational part of our missions the same culture we already have in, in academic health systems for academic health systems. If you look at how the standard of practice changes in healthcare versus education, it's very different. It's black and white. In healthcare, we actually pay people to do basic research and we pay people to translate that into clinical applications. Then we have very rigorous designs, randomized double blind clinical trials. And when an innovation proves to be better than the current standard of practice, we have a way of making sure that that makes it into the practice. I know there's a lag between innovation and adoption, I know, but eventually, you know, we're no longer bleeding people. We, you know, we actually, eventually we actually move the standard of practice based on that. And that is a major part of what we do and it's rewarded and it's recognized. We don't do any of that in education so far. I think this is the big change. We basically teach the way we were taught. <clears throat> education is very powerful socialization tool. So we teach the way we were taught. We don't have peer review because you know having another professor in the classroom is considered a, a uh, an affront to academic freedom. We seldom do assessment other than ask students to rate the professors, which is important and valuable, but it's very insufficient. And we do very little experimentation and rigorous evaluation. That is starting to change. And during the pandemic, I think there was a lot, actually, we found a, a robust literature of evaluation of innovations. Um, even the Cochrane collaboration started, you know, sort of treating it Obviously, you can't have clinical trials for education, but there are other rigorous evaluative methodologies. We need to adopt, when I mentioned in the institutional side of, of uh, recommendations, the culture of innovation and assessment, we need to do that. And that brings me to MOOCs. M MOOCs per prove not to be a sustainable business model because you basically allow people to come. MOOCs we really triggered a lot of uh, creativity in education innovation. And I saw in highly research-oriented institutions, my the school I was in, early education became an area of exploration, of creativity, of rigorous assessment. That accompanied the MOOC movement. And although MOOCs as such are, are not the dominant mode, although they have led a, a legacy of huge amounts of online instruction, I think the idea of rigorous systematic innovation and assessment, so what can move the standard of practice, that is one of its lasting effects. Um, we, we have here in, in the audience two members of the Chancellor's Cabinet, Dr. Chris Schaffer, who's the Vice Chancellor of Research, and of course, Dean Mike Reed, uh, who you met before. Um, I would like to give them a chance to um, participate, make questions uh, before giving the floor to the people in, in joining us remotely. Um, Chris? Yeah. Thanks. It's, it's with my mask off, it's Hal, not Chris. Um, <laughs> hi, nice. Thank you. 
terrific talk. I actually do have a, a question for you. What you're, um, I was fascinated by the blended uh, discussion and your matrix of kind of ratio of in-person and remote or online, I need to use the right word, to um, kind of the intent. And I wonder, I think about this a lot on the research side um, and discovery. And I wonder if you see any similarities between the, um, the education matrix and the discovery, a generation of new knowledge uh, 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 matrix and whether there are any learnings we have. This is a challenge for us and I think for, for many institutions is how to adapt to this new world and how to balance the benefits of being remote and virtual with some of what's lost. So I just, I wonder if you see any um, lessons learned out of the education field that might apply in my case to research or just more generally to how we yeah. approach our, our communities? No, I think, I think this, uh, this applies to, to, to many fields, healthcare itself. There's, you know, one of the things the pandemic accelerated and magnified was telehealth, telemedical services. They were, they were there for decades before the pandemic, but it accelerated. And what's the right blend between having the patient in person or having the patient remote? It ha and it, it applies to the to to the future of work more broadly, uh, office work even. What part can you do remotely? And what can you do in, in person? <clears throat> so I think the idea of blend is going to stay. Um, you know, and and I do want to stress. It is very different to, to separate people according to their personal circumstance. In some situations, like with the pandemic, we had to do that. If you tested positive, there's no way you, we, you couldn't come to a classroom and we still had to provide you with education. Or if you were an international student and you couldn't get a visa or a flight. But in the blended model, it is the objective you're pursuing that determines what is that mix. And that, of course, is a qualitative assessment. I think we need to do much more assessment. In the case of education, the, the, we found this idea of formative, transformative, in, informative, formative, and transformative powerful. That's from the 2010 report. But we added this component in this current paper because that's where, um, it, and you could have a similar, I mean, there are purely informative pieces, you, you know, for the monthly, whatever, paper review or uh, uh, article club. You probably don't need to be all in the same room, but there are parts of the discovery process where the chance encounter, the interpersonal, the thing that happens that's not programmed. And you know there are studies that show that uh, there's a high correlation between the physical distance of people and, and discovery. It's actually empirically been measured someone. Um, and so, so you do need that element of, of chance collisions between people who are thinking in different perspectives and, and, and you only create that when you have a, an in-person experience. Now that, in the case of education, requires a very different set of classrooms. I mean, we'll still need this kind of classrooms, but Jaime was showing me the new classrooms in the, in the, in the global science and, and clinical science building. And that's exactly the future, flexible, because what you're gonna be doing there is not lecturing. We do that better online with the, with the powerful, online platforms. But I think the, the analogy is valid. It's the clarity of what do you achieve in different, what is the goal of different uh, um, components of the enterprise, in this case, the, the research enterprise. Great. So I love the thoughts that you put forward today. So I want to think a little bit about education for life. So you talked a little bit about continuing education where we mainly do that to maintain a license or we recertify board certification to maintain privileges at a hospital. But if we expand it to our public health professionals, our researchers, and we think about the leadership skills that they need to develop throughout a lifetime, the first two categories were continuing education and certifications it's sort of a stick, right? You have, you have to do this to maintain your license or to go ahead and what you have. How do we inspire the current generation of learners to learn the interpersonal and leadership skills throughout their life to make their career more rewarding? I think that is one of our biggest challenges. And, and it's, it's by embracing the idea of universities as open systems where people are coming in and out 
of the university throughout their entire life. Now, the realities of the dynamism of the labor market are going to impose that. It's, it's the two things, both the personal professional trajectory when your own success uh, puts you in a management position. I mean, you're now dean of a dental school. I, if you're like most deans I know, there was nothing in your initial instruction in, 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 in dentistry that actually provided you with the skill set you need to be an effective dean. It's, it, 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 it is a pervasive problem. That's the, the professional trajectory. But think of how AI applications are changing. We're all scrambling now with the most recent chat box that can you know, compose. What are we gonna do? We, you know, we just sent a memo to our faculty saying, you know, you've got to start thinking of how you're gonna adjust your methods of instruction and grading to these realities. And in medicine, and nursing, this is everyday stuff in, 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 in imaging, in pathology. In, I mean, it, it is an incredible pace of progress. And like all technologies, this can be a force for good or they can wreak havoc if, we, if we're not prepared for them. And I think the idea for, for especially for the young generation, which are now all um, digital natives, the idea that you keep learning through platforms that meet you wherever you are is, is I, and, and just the reality uh, that you are going to be constantly being challenged to redefine the boundaries of your practice. <clears throat> the, 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 the other question of leadership, I have found it more challenging. And the basic challenge there is to develop health professionals that master not just the content, but the context of their practice. To me, that's what defines a change agent, which is the transformative level. That means that in addition to being a great professional and expert, you understand both the organizational context, you know, I'm part of a larger thing because no, no professional now is a solo practitioner, that's a relic of the remote past but also you understand the societal context. Where do your patients originate? What are the social determinants of all the stuff that they bring to you? How do you, what are your tools to impact that? And what are the limits of your own practice? Understanding not just the content, but the context is to me the key to become a change agent. And because then you can think, how do you change the context of the practice? And that, and that, uh, how, how do we develop that ability? I think is a very interesting challenge. It's not going to be through lecturing. It's not lectures on leadership. How do we create meaningful, immersive experiences for young people to start developing those those uh, those competencies? And uh, I, I think that's going to be the more interesting challenge. I don't. We haven't solved it, but it's it makes it an exciting challenge. Um, we're running out of time, but we do have many questions coming in the chat. Uh, Stephanie, if you could kindly select two of those. Thank you so much, Doctor. Um, well, that was a good presentation. We have a very interesting question. A person is uh, involving patients in this question, and it says, while we are educating health professionals in a more open system, is it necessary to educate the population as well? For example, in telerehabilitation, even if the professionals are skilled in using the technology, won't some, the, some patients' population find, the but find this very challenging? How this gap be bridged? I'm glad because I actually, even there I went a little bit over <laughs> the time that Jaime had given me. I removed the slide that showed a very important concept today. Well, it's always been the case, but again, that the pandemic magnified. The health system, we tend to think about it from the institutions and professionals that work there, the supply side. The health system is actually, the, the, the population is part of the health system and part of the education system. Because in both health and education, people are co-producers of their health. It's not a service that you just receive. You know, when I go and get my haircut, it is a service. I sit there, I don't, I'm not a co-producer, and then I suffer the consequences. Uh, when I either get educated or, or, or try to restore or preserve my health, 
I am a co-producer. And in the case of healthcare, the pandemic did magnify the role of information, which is now widely available. I mean, people come to the, meet the health professional full of information that they've Googled and searched for. And a lot of that is misinformation. And what we saw in the pandemic was the magnification of misinformation. We talk a lot in the article about the role of health professionals, the future role as curators of information, not so much providers. That, that was a traditional role. We actually told the patient what, what they should do, et cetera. That's not happening. They are two co-producers. So the question is very relevant. A big part of these reforms is how do we better how we, do we enable and empower people to play a constructive role as co-producers of their own health and their own education? But in the case of health, particularly challenged by the spread of misinformation. Yeah, thank you. And the next one is a uh, like proposal. It says, academic medical centers or health sciences universities to pay every clinical faculty member a full salary for three months annually. During this time, each person must be engaged as a student full-time in formal instruction, instru instructions, including classroom experience and testing as learning. This could be distinguished this individual for community, no academic, no academic clinicians. It would be expensive for the medical center universities, but would demonstrate a commitment to create a new level of professionalism and could make possible to retain this type of faculty? Well, it's a, it's a very interesting proposal, and, and a lot of universities are trying things out. Uh, I can tell you, my university, University of Miami, we have introduced, um, a, in, in the faculty orientation for new faculty, an explicit module that has to do uh, with, with, um, with, with, you know, how, how do you, just like the learners need to learn how to learn, you also need to learn how to teach in, with the new technologies. And the learning how to teach is a big part and it is ongoing. It's not necessarily three months out of the year, it is an ongoing process. We selected a group that, um, uh, that we call the uh, Education Innovation Fellows. So dozen, these are not professional teachers, these are not from the School of Education, these are all over. And these are people that have committed they are working basically in innovation and leading the way and setting a model for their peers. And we created finally an education innovation, innovation uh, accelerator or incubator, sorry, um, to actually try out new ideas and then test them rigorously, to try to emulate what we do in biotech and, and in health tech broadly for education. So, and I, if you go to the original article, especially the web annex, the literature review, I think, is one of the most interesting contributions. There's a lot of creative energy going on. And I'm sure, knowing the quality of this institution, I'm sure that a lot of this is happening here. I, I, <clears throat> uh, so, uh, but, but, but we need to invest in developing the academic workforce in a way that they are competent for this brave, brave new world, just like we're going to have to invest in redefining areas in imaging, in pathology, in a lot of other specialties, this is a, another area of, of competence. So it's, it's a, it's a, I, I appreciate the comment. Thank you so much for your answer. All right, uh, well, let me ask you and join me uh, to thank Julio for his contribution and his uh, presence. Thank you. At UCSF. Thank you.